Church Facebook friends and visitors. On behalf of our Superintendent Minister, Reverend Alcana Brian Seymour, and our church family, we extend a warm and cordial welcome to all of you. This is the seven Lord's Day after the Epiphany or Transfiguration and Eve Sunday. The service is being led by our Youth Fellowship with Reverend Seymour as our preacher, and I am your religious Rihanna Ferguson. We are glad to have you join us in the time of worship. I pray that the service will inspire and strengthen your faith in God and enrich your lives. Welcome. In preparation for worship, please stand and let us sing the chorus, This Little Light of Mine, and continue standing for the call to worship and open him. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord.
Most gracious God, you are wonderful, you are beautiful, and you are the wonder of wonders. We bless your holy and magnificent name. The whole creation speaks of your holy and majestic name, of your all creating and beautiful power. None can equal you in any way or even tell you of your wondrous works. The Holy Spirit gives utterance. We have come to you because of your love and mercy, which is so life-giving that we crave it every day. Lord, just to be alive and praise you is a gift itself. To gaze at the beauty which you have made is glorious for us, and to worship you in the beauty of holiness is our goal. We humble ourselves in your presence, O oh Lord, for you are our everything. Lord of glory, we give you all the praise you sought us, even while we were lost. You have redeemed us even before we cared to ask. Forgive us, we pray, for the times when we have fallen short of your glory. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, even now. Forgive us for all of our shortcomings, the hasty words, and unfair judgment of others. Willful and sinful habits, our lack of trust. Deliver us every time and moment we were we are tempted. O oh Lord, and restore us unto us the joy of your salvation. Wipe the slave of our lives clean and place us on the right path that will lead to you. Lord, help us, heal us. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for all the things that you continue to do in our lives. For the blessing of family and friends, we thank you. For food, shelter, and clothing, we give you thanks, O Lord. We ask that you will help us to be grateful for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing for us, and all that you will do for us. Lord, you are the great provider, Jehovah Jireh. Thanks be to you, O God, who does not look at who we are or what we have done, but whose mercy is new every month. You have taught us always to give thanks, and we are thankful people this morning, in Jesus' name. Bless this service, we pray, O Lord, and may you receive honor, glory, and praise for all of our lives, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand for the Lord's prayer.
Responsive reading is taken from Psalms 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed to say, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have sent my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make a nation to your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, with trembling. Kiss his feet, or he will be angry, and you will perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Have your all to take refuge in him. So, so. 
celebrating birthdays this month. And there are other persons who are celebrating other special occasions in their lives. And so we would also like to pray for them as well. So let's pray for our birthday celebrants. So we'd like to sing first happy birthday. She's 85 years old.
You will stand and sing in preparation for the sacrament of holy baptism in 413. See Israel's gentle shepherd stand and we ask all of the godparents and sponsors to come forward during the singing of the second verse.
present with us, Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that this child now to be baptized with this water may be raised to the new life in Christ. Amen. Amen. The promises of the church, members of the body of Christ, who are now in his name to receive this child, will you so maintain the common life of worship and service that he and all the children among you may grow in grace and in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To the parents, you have brought this child to be baptized, and you will receive him again to be trained in the doctrines, privileges, and duties of the Christian religion. I ask you, therefore, will you provide for this your child the Christian home of love and faithfulness? Will you train him by your prayers and example to renounce evil and to put his trust in Christ the Savior? God's will, be. will you train and encourage him towards confirmation in the membership of the church and to serve Christ in the world? To the God parents, will you have come to support these parents? Help them in the Christian nurture of this child. Good Let us pray, congregation may be seated. Almighty and immortal God, the aid of all who are in need and the helper of all who come to you for refuge, the light of those who believe in the resurrection of the dead, we call upon you for this child whom we bring to you in this holy sacrament. We see them, O Lord as you have promised by your well-beloved Son, saying, Ask and you shall have, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. So give to us who ask and let us who seek find. Open the gate to us who knock, that this child may become and ever remain Christ's true disciple, and may at last attain the eternal kingdom which you have promised by Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, shared at Nazareth the life of an earthly home. Bless we pray in the home of this child, and grant wisdom and understanding to all who shall have the care of him, that he may grow up in your constant fear and love. Do the same, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Merciful God and Heavenly Father, give wisdom and grace to the parents of this child, that they may train him and all their other offspring in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and in the truth of your holy word. In Jesus Christ, our only mediator and redeemer. Amen. What request is this, your child? We receive this child in the fellowship of Christ Church and pray that he may not be ashamed to hold fast the faith of Christ crucified, to fight against evil, and to persevere as Christ's faithful soldier in his life. And amen. amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his confidence upon you and give you peace.
Grant, O Lord, we beseech you that this child may continue to partake of the Holy Spirit and may grow in grace and may profit thereby unto salvation. Amen. Grant that the parents of this child may have grace to set before him the example of godly living and by their prayers, Christian instruction, and wise counsels be ministers of God to him for good. Amen. Grant that this church may be so endowed with heavenly wisdom that it may nurture the children received by holy baptism into your name and by constant care and vigilance guide them in the way of truth and the peace. Amen.
the wider congregation with some Bible trivia. Okay, now, boys and girls, I need you to listen very carefully to the trivia that we are going to deal with. But first, the congregation. I'm going to ask the congregation to do something. You're going to need to open your Bibles, or if you don't have one, there should be Bibles in the pews in front of you. So if you would pull your Bibles, the congregation will get youngsters started. Okay, now, here we go. I will ask you to look at a particular Bible verse. The first person to find it should say, got it, and raise their hand. You must do both things. Got it, and raise your hand. Or, if you know the Bible verse already, you don't even have to look it up. You just need to say it. So, this is the Bible verse that you're being challenged with. It's taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Right. Would you please stand? Would you please stand? You, you raise your hand and you say, got it? Would you please stand? And would you read it for us? See that, man. <laughs> Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Two words. That is an entire Bible verse. And yet, you know, it is not claimed to be the shortest Bible verse. Will someone offer to us the shortest Bible verse? Yes. Jesus wept. Now, both of those contain two words. Why is Jesus wept traditionally claimed to be the shortest verse in the Bible? Fewer letters. Okay. Well, we're on a roll. We're on a roll. Boys and girls, I'm going to give you an easy one now. Easy one. How many books are there in the Bible? I mean, you do religious knowledge in school, you must know that one. Will the congregation help? There are 66 books in the Bible. Uh, Well, you know, I, I'm going to twist this around. I asked for the shortest verse a little while ago. Does anyone know which verse is the longest verse in the Bible? The longest verse, not the longest chapter, the longest verse. Esther 8 and 9, and it contains 90 words in one chapter. 90 words. Now, I'm going to ask the uh, boys and girls to stand for me so we can get a little bit more involved. Would you please stand? Stand. Do you know what is the shortest Bible book? The shortest Bible book. No? Can the congregation help with that one? <coughs> the shortest Bible book is Obadiah. It has one chapter. That's it. No more than a single chapter in Obadiah. All right, I, I, I'm not sure. We're not getting the participation from these young ones. Okay. And let, me, let me twist it a little bit then. And I'm sure you have known at least one of these names. There are five persons named in the Bible who lived more than 900 years. Five persons. 
Sorry? I'll be getting to 969 and 969, but I believe the Bible says 969 years. Does anyone else know anyone else named in the Bible who lived more than 900 years? Gerard lived 962. Well, um, Gerard lived 962 years. Not, not, not. Oh boy, someone else uh, 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 not, but, but let me just say this. Let me say this so that we put it in context. And yes, Gerard lived 962 years, but I'm going to put it in context for you. Methuselah, Enoch, Jared was Enoch's father. So these people come from that same family, 969 years and 963 years. Now, anyone else? No one else. And all of them came from the same family stock. I'm going to come back to the congregation with Adam. How long did Adam live? 930. 930 years. But, but before I come to the last of these five, 900 plus years persons, Noah, who I believe the youngsters would be aware of because of the flood, Noah was 600 years old when he built the ark. And he lived for 350 years after the flood. Okay, well, I think I'm going to come to one. I you this one there. The, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 27. Boy, this congregation is I, I don't have what to do with you. Um, let, 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 me, let me see. Um, okay, okay. Two persons in the Bible are named that did not die. Two of them did not die. There's one. And Enoch was the second. Tell me what happened to the two of them. Elijah went up to heaven on a chariot of fire. And the Bible says, as this uh, prophet, but he was just taken up by God, never died. Boys and girls, when you bow your head and close your eyes for a short dismissal prayer, we bow. Heavenly Father, I see these young people prepared to return to the seats with their family members. I pray that you will. Let your loving kindness engulf them, that you keep them safe, that you keep them from all ill and all evil. And I pray these words in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls.
via the Zoom platform on Saturday, the 
verses 12 through 18. Good morning, church. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tables of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set up with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. To the others, he had said, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Look, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the Israelites. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. The first reading is taken from Second Peter, chapter one, verse sixteen to twenty-one. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are being eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father, when the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am pleased. We ourselves carried the voice come from heaven, while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the, pro the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as the light shining a dark place, until the day is dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is the word of the Lord.
text for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 17, and I'm taking into consideration verse 5 and 6. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice from the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and were sore. Pray, let us pray. O oh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and the power of your word. And now ask that your word spoken by me that it would comfort us, challenge us, and inspire us. O oh, Lord, who is our rock, our help, our strength, and 
our Redeemer. Amen. The Mount of Transfiguration was a beautiful experience for the disciples. Or what is happening within us because of what is going on around us. And what amount of transfiguration was going on in that time? For indeed it had serious myths. You know, sometimes parents like to say, Oh, I want to take my children to Disney World so they could experience the magical wonder of Disney World. Isn't that so? Yes, I, I think many of you have been there before. And, you know, you want to go on. I like, you know, I've been there. And I'm sorry, Disney World, but it wasn't all that. <laughs> it was a lot of money spent, right? <laughs> but at least you've been. And you saw what it's all about. So here it is. Jesus took his three disciples. Us. Or there's no recollection or no... That says that he died. And so I guess all the time he was there, he, he and Moses hiding in the clouds. <laughs> and then the clouds appeared, and Jesus was there, and they spoke with Jesus. And so the effects of what had happened was a profound effect on the lives of Peter, James, and John. Because when you have a mountaintop experience, you carry it with you for the rest of your life. Mountaintop experiences come to us to inspire us and to teach us and equip us for when we are to go back down into the valley. Isn't that so? Yeah, you had your mountaintop experience and now you're going back down into the valley. Many persons who have graduated, you have been burning the midnight oil and now you've got your degrees and all the rest of it, or you got your new house house, or you got your new car, or you got something that is new. But then now you have to pay the bills, huh? <laughs> yes, because you might have had the mountaintop experience, but some things come with mountaintop experiences. Because after you've gotten that degree, now you have to show your worth to people and persons who you come into contact with, and what you have bought, you have to pay for it and maintain it. And yes, you may have the thrill of the mountaintop experience. So the disciples were thrilled to be there. Jesus was transfigured, meaning that everything on him and he himself shone as light. And so it was very blinding to the disciples. And as he conversed with Moses and Elijah, they, well, they had to identify him later on. Moses and Elijah because I doubt they would have said this is Moses and this is Elijah because they would not have known Moses and Elijah it was some hundreds of years after these persons were there and so they probably asked Jesus who was that and he told them it was Moses and Elijah we are not going to understand all that is going on around us the focus that day was Jesus, not really Moses and Elijah. Even though they were there and the cloud covered them. Because the voice from the cloud said, this is my son. Jesus was identified as God's son again. You know what happened when he was baptized by John the Baptist. And now it is happening again. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Here be him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were afraid. Mountaintop experiences sometimes frighten us. I remember the first time I went in a plane, in an airplane. I didn't know what to experience. I didn't go in an airplane until I was about 19 years old. <laughs> I've seen them go up in the sky, and uh, I've admired them. And when it was my time, I was wondering what was happening. <laughs> Going up in that airplane. It was like a mountaintop experience for me because I was able to look around and see all that was going on. 
And then one of another type of mountaintop experiences, if you've ever been to Seba, one of the Dutch islands, it is another mountain top experience because the plane has a very short runway on top of the mountain. A very short runway. So what the pilot does is he starts the plane up and he really gets it to make a lot of noise. You know? And then the plane starts and then the plane has a very short runway like I said and then the plane comes off the runway and it drops and then it rises again. Isn't that a feeling? Yes, it was a feeling, I can tell you. It happened to me twice. I remember the second time I was going on that plane, and there was a gentleman, a white gentleman, and, and as the plane was going off, and you know, the pilots have to be really good, because when you're flying in, there's a wind, they call it tailwind that comes, and if you don't, the pilot don't, don't uh, do it well, because it's like you have to land in between two high pieces of mountain. You have to go right in between there. So they have, sometimes they have to circle around many times before they land in there. And when they land, it's not a long place for you to go. So when they land, they have to put on brakes right away and then the plane, so it doesn't go over the cliff. And so here it is. We won the plane and the plane was about to go. And then the plane went and it went to the edge and it went down, and it went up again, and the white man said, <laughs> <laughs> So I just smiled at myself, and I said, you know, I was afraid, but I was, I don't think I was more afraid than he was. <laughs> yes, mountaintop experiences are exhilarating. But here it is, Elijah and Moses were speaking to Jesus. Elijah and Moses represented the law and the prophets. You know Moses was the lawgiver. It was the passage of scripture read there said that God gave him the law when his face shone like light. Because when Moses went to speak to the people, his face was so bright he had to put a veil on his face so that they would not look at his face. Okay? And uh, here it is, Jesus is having that same experience. But Moses, the lawgiver, was speaking with Jesus, and Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, was speaking with Jesus. And what this says for us historically is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. All that the law ever spoke about, from the Ten Commandments to everything that was spoken of in the Old Testament, all that the prophets were preaching about God and his kingdom and everything. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. And the disciples were there to witness it. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Everything about Jesus, the fulfillment. And so when Jesus gives us his commandment, it covers everything. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The commandment of Jesus. See, because if you love God, you're not going to treat your neighbor in a certain way. Isn't that so? And if you love your neighbor as yourself, what you want for yourself, you will also want for your neighbor. Isn't that so? And so all of the commandments were culminated into this one commandment of Jesus. I don't care what you say about it. I don't care what you do. It all adds down to that one commandment. Loving God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And loving your neighbor as yourself. Now listen church. There's a thing called head knowledge. And there's a thing called application. With all the knowledge that you know, how do we apply that head knowledge to our families, to our friends, to our community, to our church, to our country, to our world? 
How do we apply love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? It's not Ten Commandments, you know, it's one. How, how do we apply that in the schools, children? How do we apply that? I'm sure there won't be no more fighting in school. Isn't that so? I'm sure the teachers won't have to worry about nothing. They just stand to the blackboard and teach. I'm sure your friends and all of those who are around you will have nothing to worry about. Because you're loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself. I am sure that that applies for our country and everybody who come in here and go out of it, from the airport to whatever. Isn't that so? Am I getting warm? And in the church, when the person comes next to you, and you see that person in the church, do you think that person has done you wrong? But you love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. I am sure that when you see that person now, your blood pressure will rise. Isn't that so? I'm getting warm, am I? Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. So if we kept the commandment of Jesus, we won't kill nobody. We won't steal from nobody. We won't commit adultery. We won't do any of those things. You know why? Because we love God. And you know why we don't do anything else? Because we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if I love myself and I love you, I want the best for you just like how I want the best for myself. Amen? Amen. So the next time you look in the newspaper, the next time you listen to the radio, the next time you go home, the next time you come to church, the next time you tell the children to go to school, Apply this knowledge. Amen? Amen? Apply this knowledge. It's not much. You don't have to keep all of them ten, you know. If you keep that one, you keep the ten. Amen? And the twenty. And the thirty. You keep every day. Jesus said it. How am I talking? <laughs> Thank you. Almost like T.D. Jakes or Joyce Meyer. <laughs> what the disciples would come to learn that their Jewish faith would take them or give them a new meaning that being in the company of Jesus the Christ and when they heard the voice of God identifying as identifying as his son it should make a difference that yes I've seen Jesus I've been with Jesus but now the voice says to me this is my son in whom I am well pleased well, you know what Peter said? Let us build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, Jesus. You know, we have a thing of, once we have a good experience, we want to keep that experience. Isn't that so? Yeah. Yes. And that's what it causes people to get in trouble. Like persons who take drugs, they always want to get that high again. They always want to get that feeling again. They always want to go back again. But you cannot ever get what you have gotten before. It's like accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. I often tell persons, the first time I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life, I think I was 14 going to high school. And everything looked new. All the flowers looked new. <laughs> everything looked new. Everything looked new. Everything, I felt good. I felt like I wanted to die then. I said, Lord, take me right now. Because I felt like I was going to heaven, you know. I, I just accepted Jesus and you know, you feel good. But then the morning came. <laughs> and then you have to face family and friends and all the rest of them. That's when the tire meets the road, amen? <laughs> Isn't that so? And when people start to look at you and say, you're a Christian, and you're doing that, and you're saying that. And you're... Because that's what people will do. That's when the devil gets them, you see? <laughs> And the devil wants to get to you. Because they're going to tell you, you're not good enough. You can't do it. You can't be a Christian. You can't. You can't. You can't. Don't let them tell you you can't. Do you hear me? 
you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And yes, you might fall down, but you are forgiven. A lot of people don't realize that, that Jesus came to help us to be forgiven so that we can live a new life. Yes, you have your bills to pay, but you have a new life. Yes, you might get angry sometimes, but you have a new life. Yes, the world doesn't seem like the best place to be, but you have a new life. And that is the difference in the life of a Christian. Amen? Amen. And you're not smiling because you just got, you got a raise. You're smiling because Jesus loves you. And you can love everybody. Amen? Amen. And so the disciples learned from that experience with Jesus. What do you do with your mountaintop experiences? I'm reminded of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, who in his last sermon said he has been to the mountaintop. And he expressed that he may not make it with the others. But he had a dream. He had a dream. He said, I have a dream. And his dream was equality. That you would not be judged by the color of your skin. Your character would be a good thing. I mean, I get to the promised land, he said, you know, and I just don't care anymore. My eyes have seen the glory. Go on YouTube and watch it, watch that speech, persons who have not seen it. These things inspire us, the lives of others who have been through it. And it tells you that he was assassinated. A young man. A very young man. But we learn a lot from his life. From his dream. That that dream can be actualized. And lived through others. But one of us. Are not many people in our lives helping us? Or do we help other persons? Do we care? Some of us, if you speak to us in a certain way or in a wrong way, we're not looking back at you. Some of us, if you break a fingernail, that's it. I'm not a Christian anymore. <laughs> Some of us, you just have a bad day and you feel like you can't get over it. Or some illness comes. My brothers and sisters, we are only human. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You will overcome as well. No matter what you go through, God is still good. You know that? God is still good. And he was good before you came here. He's good while you're here. And he's good even after you exit. God is good. My brothers and sisters, yes, from your mountaintop experience, like I said before, you graduated, you got your college degree. You may be the first in your family to uh, have status. Or you got a new job or some new opportunity. You should be able to help other persons. Amen? It's not about you. We're all in this thing together called life. And none of us gets out of it with a get out of jail free card. <laughs> Your mountaintop experience should help somebody in the valley. Somebody is trying to see the light. You know, the other side of the coin is that not everyone inherits. There are some persons who become successful by burning the midnight oil. There's a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow which said that the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but while their companions slept, they were, uh, they were toiling upward in the night. Yes, my brothers and sisters, no matter how you get what you get, share it. Amen? Yes. 
The valley is where you get the real people. The valley is where Jesus was when he met his disciples. He didn't go to the temple and say, hey, I want you to follow me. He went to the sea and he saw Peter and James and John and said, follow me. He went to the tax collectors, persons who were despised in those days. And he said to Matthew, follow me. You understand where I'm coming from? He said, I didn't come to the righteous, but I came to bring sinners to repentance. For those who feel like they're righteous and they don't need God, leave them alone. Amen? Amen. But there are persons who need God and I'm one of them. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Could never get enough of God. And my brothers and sisters, that's where the valley is. And so the people who Jesus surrounded himself with, he didn't let them rub off on him. Jesus rub off on them. Isn't that so? So God said, listen to him. You thought that you knew it all, right? Remember that religious man called Nicodemus? He was a teacher in the Jewish faith. Very high up there. But he came to Jesus by night because he didn't want nobody to see him. And as he came to Jesus by night, he said, I know you're a good man, I know you. Jesus said, don't call nobody good. Say, only one that's good, and that is God. And then Jesus going to tell him who God is. God is spirit. And Jesus tell him, you know, you think you know it all? You need to be born again. You know, being born again is hard. You thought the first birth was hard? The second birth is even harder. It's a spiritual birth. Nicodemus said, was I enter my mother's womb again and be born? Jesus said, no. It's like the spirit. You don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it's going. Those who are born of flesh is flesh, but those who are born of spirit is spiritual. And you have to unlearn all that you knew in order to get the new information. Isn't that so? When you come to God, you can't come with a cup full. You have to empty your cup. Amen? And say like the woman, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. There's a thirst in there. The cup is full, but you are thirsty. Because what is in the cup will not save. Stephen was one of the first that he killed. And they threw all of their clothes at Paul's feet. But yet, Stephen looked up into heaven as they were stoning him and said, Lord, forgive them, have mercy on them. Doesn't it sound like Jesus on the cross? Who pardons us? How many of us are going to say, Lord, forgive them while they're cussing us. You would have your choice, you were too. And don't let them put their hand on me. Like I tell you, grass will not grow when we meet. Isn't that so? <laughs> we ready. But are we ready for Jesus like that? Because only what is done for Christ will last. You beat me up today, I beat you up tomorrow. And somebody say, you get killed today, and somebody else from my family kill you. And that's how it goes on and on and on and on. As uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth leaves the whole world blind and toothless. Because this thing will go on and on and on. If my family have a problem with another family, I am not going to tell my children we have a problem with that family. Because if I keep doing that, the problem keeps perpetuating. Isn't that so? 
It goes on and on and on. And you, when you read the Bible, that's what it is. Enmity between tribes. From years ago, Israel and Palestine would never be like this. They will always be at war. But they are very close in blood. And my brothers and sisters, that's how you and I too. We all from the bomb, is not me, some of us. But we are related by blood and still we kill one another. Why? Funerals are expensive. Grief, you never get consummate for. That thing goes deep, deep down in there. I'm going to close with a story of a lady that I read from the Caribbean magazine long, some years ago. And she said, you know, well, a news reporter came to, to interview her because she has been through some stuff. What happened was, she was living in another country with a, with a husband and children. And her husband wanted to leave, but she said she wanted to stay. And as a result, some military thing broke out. And they apparently nailed her husband and children in the house and burned them down. She lost them all. They raped her and left her for dead. And she said she somehow managed to crawl to another village where somebody nursed her wounds with salt and water until she could catch herself again. But she didn't leave at that time. She could not leave. She had no money. And then she was able to somehow muster up something and she said she built a house and he was able to have a kid again, a daughter who burned the house down, a little piece of house she had. But she was being interviewed by someone. And she said to the person who was interviewing her, because they said, how, how is it that, you, that you've gone through so much and you're still able to smile? And she said, you know what, what has been done to me? You can't even go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or to somebody to talk about it. She said, it has escaped my body and my mind. It has gone to my soul. But Jesus reached it. You hear me? Jesus reached it. Sometimes what people do to you, it escapes your body and your mind. It goes to your soul. And only Jesus can reach it. There are a lot of people walking around with this feeling that only Jesus can reach. And my brothers and sisters, we have to help find these people and give them Jesus so that they can be healed. Why walk around with the world on your shoulders? It was said one time, a man was laying in the grass and he was drunk. And the person said to him, Hey man, why are you laying in the grass? He said, I am holding up the world. <laughs> but remember, he was drunk. He didn't know the difference. You can't take the world on your shoulder. Jesus is the great burden bearer. That is why he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My brothers and sisters, we can all smile. You know why? Because we have Jesus. You won't get everything in this world, but once you have Jesus, you have everything that the world cannot offer you. The world can give you joy, and the world can take it away. But Jesus gives you joy unspeakable. Speakable. Joy that will last forever. And so when Jesus gives us that mountaintop experience, we never lose it. We never lose it. Because that is what our life is all about. This is my son, God said. Hear him.
It is a great thing to serve the Lord in Jesus Christ. It is our greatest mountaintop experience. That's the best experience I ever had. If I won the lotto and remember, methods don't gamble. <laughs> but I'm just saying, if I won the lotto, I don't even think that I could feel as good as that. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> Jesus gives you a good feeling. If I was on drugs, I don't even think I could feel as good as that. Just to be alive and to praise the Lord. You hear me? He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes, I have bad days, but I am a good Savior. Amen. <laughs> he takes me through. He takes us through. My brothers and sisters, draw closer to God, and he will draw closer to you. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, I have Give you thanks for those mountaintop experiences. Those times in our lives when we feel exhilarated. When we feel like we're on top of the world. But then there comes the valley. The valley of indecision. The valley of financial difficulty. The valley of illnesses, of disenchantment, when we fall out of love with others. Help us. Use us. Guide us, Lord, and keep us. Help those who the pain and the suffering and the misery that has escaped their body and mind, that has gone to their soul to be touched by you. Wash us, Jesus, wash us. Cleanse us. And seal our souls. The day of redemption. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit blaze, and set our hearts on fire. Flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we go forth out of this sanctuary, we go into the valley, but the light of Jesus is in our hearts. Shine, Jesus, shine in every corner of our darkness and in enlighten us, our homes, our school, our workplaces, our community, our country, our world. May the God of peace be with you. Blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.